really, really interesting projects uh, as of recent. We just set up a, a, a small scale mushroom grow shed situation uh, to start supplying mushrooms for market. And so far I've harvested almost 50 pounds in the past two weeks out of this setup that I just got going. Um, and uh, we're working on currently setting up an outdoor or semi outdoor growing uh, uh, situation with a kind of shade tent, um, very similar to uh, cultivation styles that you'll see in Southern Asia, uh, which typically work very, very well. So uh, we're going to be doing that. And then we're going to be working on a new little uh, King oyster project that uh, I've been seeing a lot of information out of Greece uh, with a lot of success uh, with individuals cultivating King oyster mushrooms by burying them um, in mineral rich soil. Uh, under shaded areas. So I'm really going to uh, have a lot of fun this year playing around with a lot of mushroom cultivation, but might as well go ahead and get started. I'll uh, just do a little selfless uh, promotion real quick. So that's just like a little video graphic for um, my web store. Um, for those of you that don't know about my work, I do a lot of work with cultivating cordyceps mushrooms. So that's one of the uh, big products that we sell at mycoshop.net. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that as we go on. Um, so yeah, um, uh, as you can see here, we use child labor in the labs. Um, they have little, real tiny hands. They're really good at, uh, at cloning mushrooms. Uh, I'm just joking, but I, I do a lot of education um, and I have no age limit on the um, on the students that I'll teach as long as they're not interrupting the classroom. And as you can see, this laboratory setup, it looks very like homey uh, because it is in my it was in one of my previous uh, houses. Um, and I've, I've always done a lot of education out of my house uh, to show people that it doesn't take um, some super expensive facility to be able to produce sterile culture. Um, and that's a really a uh, um, big focus of mine is just making mycology, making mushroom cultivation more applicable um, and more easy to uh, get, get started. So at this point, I've educated thousands of people, um, both at my home and around the country um, on mushroom cultivation, uh, everything from specializing with cordyceps to generalized mushroom education, wild foraging, um, outdoor mushroom cultivation, so on and so forth. Um, and outdoors is really where it starts. Uh, as far as my business goes. So my business is Mycosymbiotics. I started Mycosymbiotics when I was 21 years old in 2015. Um, and uh, part of our big focus when I started uh, was cultivating local native strains. So a lot of people are cultivating these uh, commercialized strains coming from Germany, coming from China. Um, and some of them are developed in the US, um, but almost everybody's cultivating these commercial strains and they're typically gonna be non-native and there's, and there's nothing that's, uh, they're non-native to your local area. Um, the, a lot of them are native to the United States, but, um, and there's nothing wrong with cultivating those mushrooms. I mean, they're very high producing, high yielding mushrooms that are gonna work well as uh, far as marketing goes and making sure that your production stays up. Um, but as I saw trends uh, moving towards local produce, uh, native plants, native mushrooms. Um, I figured I'd uh, get ahead of the trend and start uh, producing and selling both uh, local native mushrooms, fruiting bodies at market and also local native culture. So um, in 2015, I went out and I collected about 30 plus uh, species of edible and medicinal mushrooms um, from, from local uh, ecosystems and began cultivating them. So this is a picture of me last fall harvesting uh, what I dubbed the flame oyster, um, because as you can see, the uh, tree that I'm harvesting from was completely burned. This was during, a, uh, this is in a controlled burn area. Um, and these oyster mushrooms were just prolific on this burned tree. Um, so this, this culture is actually producing for me very well on the farm right now. Um, and I've, I've found a way to connect uh, with more individuals as far as farmer's market goes with these local native mushrooms um, by naming them after the places th that I find them. Um, so a couple years ago, I had a oyster mushroom that I called the St. Teresa's oyster, which I found in the parking lot of a private school in New Cumberland, Pennsylvania, where I was doing the farmer's market. And when I would bring those St. Teresa's oysters to market, people would ask, 
why are they called this? I would give them the whole story and then they would feel some sort of connection to the product uh, uh, prior to purchasing it, which kind of uh, eases up a little of that mycophobia since mushrooms are so foreign to a lot of people. You'll uh, start to notice this as you try and talk to more people about mushrooms, as you try and market mushrooms, so on and so forth. Um, this is one of my uh, older mushroom grows. Um, and there's my friend, Mark, he works for the uh, agro or the forestry services here in Pennsylvania. Um, and uh, he's wearing a jacket there. He's all uh, uh, clothed up because it's cold outside. And because it's cold outside, you can see them cultivating white and blue oyster mushrooms, which grow very well in colder temperatures. So I try and switch my mushroom varieties uh, based on the uh, outdoor temperature so that I'm not modulating and adjusting too much indoors and not spending more than I need to on utilities. Um, but yeah, I, I started out very modular. Um, coming from the background that I come from, I'm not traditionally trained. I didn't uh, have the opportunity to go to college. I had to teach this to myself and uh, figure out how to do this while working at a restaurant. So um, I slowly poured some of my funds into the uh, small mushroom grow rooms, and then I waited until the mushrooms were producing enough funds before I then expanded on uh, to something else. Um, and going along the same lines as in saving uh, resources or making your work more economical, um, you can see that I have a lot of these mushroom blocks hanging on rope ladders from the ceiling. Uh, because these rack units in the back can go anywhere from 40 to $100 per unit, depending on plastic or stainless steel. And um, that was just something I couldn't afford at the time. So I could afford yards and yards of uh, paracord, uh, which I then turned into rope ladders and tied together at the top. And I was able to uh, hoist my mushrooms uh, from the ceiling. And this is another technique that I got from Southern Asia. Um, I like to tell people, even though I dropped out of high school, I did graduate, but I graduated from YouTube University. Um, I did learn a lot on YouTube, uh, especially watching uh, videos from Southern Asia where they have a lot of really low-tech techniques that are very, very efficient. Um, so this worked out for me until I was able to afford the rack systems, which I eventually uh, worked up into. Um, and you can see here just some close-up of these blues and white oyster mushrooms. Um, I typically will grow my oyster mushrooms from the side of the bag as well as the top of the bag. Um, the side of the bag will have some sort of like back to it. Um, and these are easier to break up. They're a little bit smaller. Um, and those do very well at farmer's markets, whereas the mushrooms that are growing from the top of the bag, they get very big in this flower formation, uh, which is very appealing to chefs. And I'll typically sell those to chefs. Um, but you can see here, eventually I saved up and I went ahead and got all these plastic racks. Um, uh, these were really easy to just spray down whenever they got covered in spores and, and uh, liquid that excretes from the mushroom bags. Um, really easy to clean up. Um, and I filled up this grow room here with oyster mushrooms, um, gold and blue oyster mushrooms. And this picture is about four or five days after the first picture. Um, and you can see um, a little bit of these mushroom caps are starting to open up. Um, and at that point, they're not going to have as long of a shelf life. So you're definitely going to want to uh, pick your mushrooms before the caps open up all the way or get wrinkly. Um, this way they'll have longer shelf life. At this point, this is uh, more of a product that I would dehydrate and, and then process into some other products or sell it as dry mushrooms. Um, but if you want to see any more about this uh, particular situation, you can check out my YouTube channel, uh, which is just Apex Grower. That's A-P-E-X Grower. Um, and you can watch videos that I posted from this. Um, this one was a little funny because I had one person working for me and he was on vacation on the same weekend that I had to teach two classes, one in Baltimore and one in Philadelphia. So I had to jump between Philadelphia and Baltimore to this farm outside of Harrisburg and harvest some of these mushrooms in between these two teaching days. So that's how some of these mushrooms got away from me. So it is really important to have help um, because mushrooms are very demanding. Um, if you're not there to take care of them every day, they could just completely just pop up and, and be bad by the time that you get back. Um, so they do need a lot of tending to, and it is good to have uh, a farm hand or, uh, or even a family member that's there to help you. I don't know if I'm good. Uh, here's a chat box. Um, okay. I'll just check in to see if anybody asks any questions. Um, so here we have lion's mane. Lion's mane mushroom is becoming more popularized um, uh, just due to its uh, nerve growth factors. Um, and, uh, and it's 
benefits for the brain. So we've been advertising this a lot as a nootropic mushroom because it can uh, increase cognitive function. Um, and a lot of, we find that we're selling a lot of these without having to advertise or teach as much because more people are starting to see these things on like Facebook and Instagram um, or their family or friends are sending them articles on it. Um, so a lot more of the market is becoming educated with these mushrooms and they're e becoming easier to sell. And this is one of the more high price point mushrooms that we're growing as far as like cultivated mushrooms go. Um, there's my son Leonidas holding lion's mane. He's been helping out at the mushroom farm since he could help out and uh, helping to market them and all that. And he's been eating mushrooms his whole life. Um, as far as like getting children to eat mushrooms, I think it's just really important to introduce children to diverse foods whenever they can eat. I mean, he's been eating mushrooms his whole life and could, couldn't care less, doesn't think anything of it, doesn't think they're gross or whatever. I think it's just like trained into children that uh, that are going to eat kid food, which is typically like junk food and stuff. So um, just one thing to note. Um, and, and we can make mushrooms more fun for children to eat. Um, I've been taking chicken of the woods and other mushrooms like shiitake and putting them through a food processor um, and then mixing them with like a little bit of egg or flax and breadcrumbs and then frying them up into like little mushroom circles or mushroom. He calls them mushroom circles, but um, they're just kind of like faux chicken nuggets um, that turn out really good. So there are ways to just make these foods more um, appealing to people that might not want to eat them. Uh, here we have some chestnut mushrooms that I was growing. This is foliota adiposa, one of the couple of foliota mushrooms that we eat. Um, this is another cold weather uh, loving mushroom. So I do end up growing a lot more mushrooms in the winter time because it's easier uh, as far as the temperature goes. It's a little bit uh, more difficult at this time of year when it's really hot to keep a facility uh, cool enough for growing all sorts of mushrooms. And that's one of the reasons why I switch up what I'm growing. But this is a great marketing mushroom as the stem and cap are of the same kind of texture. Um, and you can just eat that whole thing up. It's super delicious. Uh, here is an uh, example of playing around with CO2 manipulation. So this is something that we do sometimes to offer a uh, variation, offer a little something uh, novel as far as the mushroom market goes. Um, so these are beach mushrooms that are grown um, in high CO2 environment when you tip, where you'll, you will typically see uh, enoki mushrooms grown in this fashion. Um, it is possible to play around with and manipulate other mushroom species, um, especially something with a delicious stem and a great stem texture like uh, like the beach mushroom. This is Hypsozygus tessulatus. Um, that one is has a kind of a fishy flavor. Um, and it's really fun to see them do things like this that you typically wouldn't see at market um, and just be kind of innovative, you know. Um, here we have wine cap mushrooms. Uh, I personally cultivate a ridiculous amount of wine cap mushrooms. I just got off. I just got a whole truckload of oak chips dropped off at my house um, two weeks ago, I'd say, and I immediately planted a bunch of wine cap patches. And these do so well here. Um, Pennsylvania has been incredibly rainy. I think last year we almost had enough rain to be considered a, a rainforest of sorts. Um, and and the way that it's been raining here now, it, it's. Uh, um, kind of reinforcing that. Um, but the amount of rain, we've been getting a ridiculous amount of mushrooms. And I'm actually finding a lot of wild wine caps um, that I've been bringing in um, and using this wild wine cap spawn um, and just taking wood chips from the area where the wild wine caps were growing or doing rough uh, uh, outdoor cloning methods of these mushrooms and then putting them into my yard and my wood chips um, and around my hedges and things like that so we can get uh, a load of mushrooms without really having to do anything. So that's something that I've become very, very interested in is passive mushroom gardening, passive, passive mushroom farming, um, where you just kind of leave mushrooms outside and let them do their thing. Um, and then you get mushrooms usually when it rains. Um, and I've been playing around with this for a couple years. It took me a while to like dial it into the point where I'm getting marketable mushrooms that are not getting ravaged by insects, um, that are not getting all dirty and things like that, that I can take, uh, eventually take to market and uh, I've been getting a lot of success recently. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, I do work with a lot, a lot with cordyceps. Um, I was one of the first um, uh, cordyceps fruit body producers or publicly announced uh, cordyceps fruit body producers because there are um, some uh, cordyceps mushroom farmers in the U.S. Um, that just don't really like have social media or put it out there. They just kind of um, sell things low key. Um, I actually just found out about a couple Frenchmen in New Jersey that are producing cordyceps and selling them way, way cheaper than I am. Um, and they've got it all dialed in. Their cordyceps are very, very beautiful and they sell through large, larger food distributors. Um, 
but in 2016, I released the Cordyceps Cultivation Handbook, uh, which was the first English guide in the world on cultivating Cordyceps mushrooms. So that's something I'm very proud of. Um, and I'm definitely uh, working on raising money, um, looking at some grants, maybe potentially doing a Kickstarter or something of that nature to um, write the second Cordyceps Cultivation Handbook because I've learned so much. Um, and since 2015, when I started cultivating them and since the release of my book, I've seen over a hundred cordyceps farmers uh, start to pop up in the United States. A lot of them using my cultures or, or my friends' cultures, a lot of them using my information and information from my Facebook group, which is the cordyceps cultivation group, um, where people share information, people share pictures of their cordyceps grows. Um, so it's really interesting to see this proliferate from um, uh, the information that I released and the information that my friends and I have worked on. Um, and yeah, these cordyceps right now, they have a high price point as far as like, uh, as medicinals go. Um, in comparison to the Tibetan cordyceps, they're definitely cheaper, um, but it's still an uh, um, economical venture to get into. Um, so I'm, I'm right now working on an, uh, setting up another uh, large-scale cordyceps uh, grow, uh, which we actually just got uh, certified naturally grown. We're just waiting on our last inspection and we can have the certified naturally grown cordyceps eventually um, want to step up the farm to organic and good agricultural practices and so on and so forth. Um, so this is pictures from the grow right now. I told you all I just set up a mushroom shed in the backyard uh, where I've been growing blue oysters. I've been growing these gold oysters that you see here. Um, I've also been growing lion's mane. So I just picked these lion's mane yesterday. Um, no, or on, uh, yeah, yesterday was Tuesday. I picked these yesterday morning and um, one of my employees took these uh, to farmers market for us and uh, sold a lot of them. I think we actually sold out of them. And just like I was saying, more people are becoming interested in these, so they're a little bit easier to sell. Um, but you can see these lines main are a lot bigger than the other lines main I was growing. Um, again, uh, co commercial strains are going to be really uh, good producers. And the first one I showed you was wild strain. Um, so I really like to mix, just have a mix of them going at the same time um, to be able to offer the natives. Um, and be able to offer the abundance that comes with these commercial streams. Um, here I'm in Philadelphia at a farm called Mycopolitan picking up their spent mushroom spawn. So a lot of large scale mushroom farms, they only flush their mushrooms once or twice, um, which leaves a lot of energy to be uh, producing more mushrooms. So I'll go pick up mushroom spawn from them. I'll uh, create these passive mushroom gardens where I just get ridiculous amounts of mushrooms every time it rains. Um, here's my son with some of the king oysters that came from their spent mushroom spawn uh, that just grew outside from the rain. Um, so, I mean, you can see these grow really large outside, and this is another reason why I want to start cultivating these outdoors uh, with this varied spawn method. So I'm really excited to play around with that and uh, post my results online and maybe write an article about it or something. Um, here I am in uh, Washington State uh, hunting truffles with uh, a friend of mine and her dog that she trained uh, to find truffles. So um, this is super exciting. A lot of people don't really think of the United States when it comes to truffles. More people think of like Italy and France and Spain, um, so on and so forth. Um, but I really got into selling truffles a couple years ago and then I was actually selling the European truffles, but I, was, I figured why sell these truffles and import them and all this when there are American truffles and there are American truffle uh, businesses that I could be working with supporting American uh, uh, jobs and so on and so forth. So um, it was really fun to get out there and see how we get these American truffles. And then also I've had the opportunity to uh, visit farms around the country where people are starting to see success uh, with truffle trees that they planted on their own properties uh, with Italian or European truffle varieties actually growing here on U.S. soil. Um, and also be able to play around with other native truffles that completely are overlooked at this point in time. There's like really beautiful Pennsylvania truffles that absolutely nobody forages, like maybe a few mushroom experts that know how to find them uh, by watching squirrels harvest them. But I'm really, really excited to potentially get some truff trained truffle dogs into Pennsylvania to go find truffles, which the season is now through August, September uh, for our wild truffles that grow around oak trees. Um, and then also when I was living in the South last year, I, was, uh, I got exposed to the uh, Southern pecan truffles that grow in pecan trees. So I think there's a lot of potential for American truffle cultivation, American truffle distribution. Um, and that's something that I'm really excited to be working with. Um, so here's just uh, the black Oregon truffles that we're uh, foraging 
Um, beautiful truffle has a very, very fruity smell. Um, super delicious and great for incorporating into drinks and desserts. Um, and then we do markets. So um, I do a lot of online sales. I'm working on getting into wholesale uh, more with the medicinal mushrooms, the cordyceps, the lion's mane, um, as we set up our farm and uh, potentially hopefully get some grants to uh, move forward with a lot of these other applications that we're working with, which I'm super, super excited about. And hopefully it all uh, ends up working out this year. Um, but to keep ourselves afloat um, while we're working on all these other projects, we do a lot of farmer's markets. Um, so that's Leo there slinging the mushrooms. Um, we had some lion's mane, some shiitake and some oyster mushrooms. A lot of times I'll uh, buy shiitake from other local farmers just to support other farmers. There's a lot of farmers that have a lot of uh, shiitake logs um, because I really don't like cultivating shiitake indoors. They make a mess. They're a little bit um, more annoying to work with than other mushrooms as far as indoor cultivation goes. So I really, really prefer log grown shiitake and I'll just typically buy them from friends uh, to support their business as well. Um, and to offer more diversity at my farmer's market because a lot of the people that are doing these log grown cultivation, they're doing other things. They have, uh, they mostly sell wholesale anyways, because you get such an abundance of shiitake if you're doing proper log cultivation. Um, so yeah, we'll do lots of farmer's mar markets. Um, also, um, in Pennsylvania, um, uh, we do have certification for wild, uh, mushrooms right now that you can go get, um, or, uh, what I did, which the uh, USDA rep approved, uh, was I just got a letter from a mushroom expert that's recognized uh, either via uh, having a mycological degree uh, or through the North American Mycological Association. So I had somebody just write me a letter that said I'm capable of identifying uh, wild mushrooms. And I do a lot of wild mushroom identification uh, education. Um, so here we're selling chanterelles. We have these black trumpets. We also have these chicken of the woods. Uh, this was a couple years ago at the farmer's market and working with these wild mushrooms is really incredible, um, especially to be able to bring to the table uh, next to the gourmets and offer a big diversity and get more people uh, tuned into the mushroom, uh, 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 the mushroom world. Um, and uh, we also do a lot of different markets uh, throughout the year where we don't just sell mushrooms, but we also sell mushroom products. So um, I have been working with a business called Cognitive Function that was based out of New York. Um, we had a certified kitchen in Greenpoint in Brooklyn. Um, since then, Cognitive Function has moved to Pennsylvania. And um, right now we're actually we're, uh, looking to try and maybe rent or find some place to utilize as a certified kitchen and get it um, certified for our processes so we can uh, start creating our products again um, and working with other unique products that I'm really, really excited to release that aren't mushroom related. And if you're interested, just check out my Instagram at mycosymbiote um, if you want to get in on some of those other cool projects that we're working on. But um, all these value added products are super amazing. We have like a, a cordyceps flame cider. We do tinctures, which we're kind of moving away from because tinctures are so available and we're trying to really innovate in the field of mushrooms. Um, a lot of people are just doing the same thing. So we're trying to offer things that aren't currently available. Um, so we'll do mushroom infused oils, ghees, coconut oil. We'll do fermented mushrooms, pickled mushrooms, uh, mushroom seasoning salts, uh, mushroom soup mixes. And uh, again, just working on more innovative things that we're going to do, start doing some integrated um, mushroom and algae products uh, with some of the spirulina that we've been growing on the farm. So I think that's going to be really exciting and um, something really new that people might be interested in. Um, this was at Farmer's Market last weekend in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. So you can see just what I'm producing right now. We had the blue oyster mushrooms, the gold oyster mushrooms, just like I showed you, um, and these chicken of the woods. Um, you really make the most money off your mushroom at, at Farmer's Market by breaking them down into pints and half pints. You're able to sell them a little bit more than you would sell them as far as like wholesale or to a restaurant. Um, so that's one of my favorite ways to sell mushrooms and make a little extra cash. Um, so since I was 21 years old, since I was 21, um, I've been traveling around the country teaching people about mushrooms. Um, so this was just last month on my birthday, actually. Um, I was in Arizona, a little bit north of Phoenix in this sustainable city, um, that was built by an incredible architect and it's called, uh, Arco Santi. Um, very, very beautiful place. And I was there for this big festival uh, to teach these folks about mushrooms, which was really great. Um, I really 
like going to places where people might not expect it um, or where, where this information doesn't usually get to. Um, and I've seen such an incredible response from things like this. So um, this was like kind of like a big music festival, um, but I went there and taught about mushrooms. And since then I've made a lot of beautiful connections and also seen a lot more people that were there become interested in mushrooms where they might not have been. So that's really, really fun. Um, I also um, do a lot of these cordyceps cultivation classes and also low tech uh, cultivation classes. Um, as I, I believe like low tech mycology and low tech cultivation methods are more of like a micro resilience kind of skill um, because they're very applicable. It's easy to replicate. Uh, you don't need a lot of funds to work on it. So I'll go to different places and just teach people um, these real low tech methods or I'll do lab demonstrations, even if I'm not in a lab to kind of get people more um, um, used to seeing these things or um, more versed in, in what's actually going on. Uh, so this was a, at a cordyceps class I was teaching in Olympia, Washington in uh, March, I believe. Um, I also teach at a lot of agricultural conferences. So this was at the um, Organic Grower School um, at Mars Hill University, uh, where we do hands-on low-tech uh, oyster uh, uh, spawn. So everybody that comes to these classes um, ends up going home with oyster spawn. Typically I'm using like uh, paper materials and things like that. And we go through all the processes for them to expand their spawn. Um, and I've seen lots of people uh, via social media, Facebook, Instagram, share pictures um, after they take home the oyster spawn that I give them of them actually growing these mushrooms out, which is really, really cool. And like sometimes people end up giving them to their family members, giving them to a child or something like that um, for them to, to uh, uh, play with and see. And I think it's really important for more people to get their hands on and actually see how mushrooms grow. Um, Here's just some more uh, classes from my house. Um, this was actually Cordyceps uh, cultivation workshop. These pictures are from the same class. This one was actually in the grow room and then this one was um, in the lab setup. Um, I just had like sort of like a little renegade uh, small lab setup at the beginning of the year and now finally got my full lab setup at my new home that I moved here in April. Um, so this is from our last location. Um, uh, yeah, and the cordyceps classes have been really great. Uh, just like I said, I've taught thousands of people, but I've taught I've taught thousands of people just general like uh, focused on cordyceps. And also, um, proud to say that I've sold over two thousand copies of the cordyceps cultivation handbook. So it's really cool to see that information get out there. Um, here you see um, doing this um, yesterday's news technique, uh, which I learned in Atlanta. Um, I do a lot of mushroom club circuits. So uh, the North American Mycological Association works with all these regional mushroom clubs and typically the regional mushroom clubs work with each other. Um, there's typically like three or four mushroom clubs in a specific region um, where they'll share speakers. So they'll have like a talk on Tuesday, a talk on Wednesday, a talk on Thursday, a talk on Friday, whatever. Um, and, and they'll just travel me around and, uh, um, have me teach at all these different mushroom clubs, which is really cool to meet all these different mushroom folks all around the country that are focused on all aspects of mushrooms from cultivation to wild foraging um, and see all the things that they're doing. So that's kind of how I've rapidly developed um, skills and, and learned so much about mushrooms in such a short period of time. Um, but I learned about this yesterday's news technique, which is basically using this 99.9% .9 recycled newspaper cat litter, mixing it with cold water um, no sterile environment. You don't even have to wash your hands and you, uh, you hydrate these newspaper, add oyster spawn, put it in a sandwich baggie or something like that. Um, and it grows perfectly fine. Um, and you can grow mushrooms. So like I do this as a lot, a lot for, um, low tech education. Um, this photos from Atlanta, um, at an inner city urban farm. Um, and, it was actually like this really beautiful green space. You can see there's these large trees behind me and there's a creek. So this was like right, uh, it was in the city more towards the edge and right at the edge of this creek, um, which was really interesting to see, but it was in a very low socioeconomic area. Um, so everything around it was uh, pretty much low socioeconomic. So it was really interesting to see um, this beautiful, uh, powerful black woman, um, uh, providing information, providing fresh food, showing, uh, standing out as an example um, uh, for the people in her neighborhood and doing this. And then um, this was like a permaculture work day where I was invited out to uh, install mushrooms and teach these folks about mushrooms. But it's really interesting when you get into these inner cities um, and realize a lot of people have no ecological literacy whatsoever. Um, so it's really interesting to 
uh, uh, develop the teaching skills necessary to communicate with people that have no background in what you're teaching. So um, I, I find I run into this a lot as a teacher, um, typically when teaching in inner cities. When I'm doing the ag conferences, people uh, usually have a little bit more literacy as far as agriculture and uh, ecology goes. Um, so these are always really interesting. Um, here I was um, installing a wine cap mushroom bed uh, in between these rows of gardens, um, and that was a lot of fun. Uh, to get out there and uh, get my hands dirty with folks. Um, again, this is at Mars Hill University at the Organic Grower School. Um, this was at the SOG conference, which is the Southern Agricultural Working Group. Um, and it's really, really great to be able to uh, reach out to so many people. Um, and this is another way that I market my products as well. Um, when I do these classes, um, I just throw little bits about what I'm doing, my work, um, and the products that I offer. And then you can see how many people are out in the crowd. It's a really great opportunity to be able to just sell your products at the end of the class. Um, this is a picture from last year's uh, Mycosymbiotics Mushroom and Arts Festival. So for the past five years, uh, part of my community outreach and community engagement has been offering this uh, Mushroom and Arts Festival the first weekend of August every year. Typically, we find over 200 species of mushrooms. Uh, we identify all of them. We have experts um, uh, from around the Northeast and Mid-Atlantic come out. We identify all these mushrooms. We typically get a lot of really good genetics for cultivation. Um, uh, and we have a lot of fun. We have a lot of vendors out. Um, we have a lot of teachers that are experts this year. We're going to have Trad Cotter. Uh, we're going to have Matt Powers. Uh, we're going to have uh, Ryan Gates, who's a Ganoderma expert, a Reishi expert. Um, and a lot of really fun people uh, come out to educate. So um, just kind of getting people together, spreading the mushroom knowledge, uh, advancing the mushroom culture. Um, and that's something I've been focused on for five years. Um, also integrating mushrooms into um, very high-end culinary uh, cuisine, which increases the value of your mushrooms. So uh, we've been doing exotic food dinners, uh, both in the wintertime, we do like more like exotic, exotic, which where the we import foods. Um, and then in the summer, uh, spring through fall, we do local exotic. Um, so exotic really just means something that's foreign. And a lot of people, to a lot of people, wild foods are foreign. So uh, we bring in these wild foods, we incorporate them with mushrooms we cultivate, uh, we incorporate them with wild foraged mushrooms. Um, and then we do these really in, uh, interesting uh, exotic food dinners where we get people together. It's kind of like a dinner club. Um, and we have uh, one of the uh, high-end chefs from the local area prepare these mushrooms and uh, all sorts of other foods in beautiful ways. Uh, we have lots of fun doing this. And also this really, really increases the value of our mushrooms as we put these things on social media, as the chef shares them. Uh, other chefs in the area try to uh, reach to this tier. They want to get access to these ingredients. And when you're the one providing them, that puts you in a really good spot. Um, so here we have uh, the cordyceps mushrooms I was cultivating both fruiting bodies and the mycelial cake, which is grown on rice. Um, uh, we uh, put these in the oven and then fried them up with a little bit of butter and those came out super amazing. We've had people that said that they didn't like mushrooms completely like fall in love with this cordyceps cake. And we did that with some morels and, and pomegranate arils and other greens. Um, so that was really, really fun. Um, so I do a lot of these lecture circuits. I'll advertise, I'll advertise a lot on social media. That's typically how I do everything. Almost all my classes at the beginning, I ask everybody how they found out about the class. Um, nine times out of 10, it's gonna be Instagram. Um, so you can see I have a lot of different uh, variety in things that I teach. Uh, we do these mushroom talks, mushroom walks, um, uh, insects, algae, all these different things. But for the sake of this class, I'll just keep everything focused on mushrooms. Um, we have... Uh, Urban Myco Design Immersion coming up uh, August 9th through the 11th. I'll do these three-day training weekends where I actually bring people on the farm. They get hands-on lab skills. Uh, we uh, work on grow room build-outs. Um, we do outdoor mushroom cultivation, indoor mushroom cultivation, low-tech, uh, and full-on sterile uh, cultivation work. So um, I'm really excited to be offering these classes again. I, uh, in the past, have offered three to five-day uh, uh, mushroom intensives. Uh, where we get a lot of work done, uh, working with lots of species and, and lots of different application techniques. Um, and then again, um, this is this year's flyer for the Mycosymbiotics Mushroom and Arts Festival. And I'm super, super excited to offer this. Um, we have a gentleman coming out, John Martin. He's an expert in Florida uh, fungi. Uh, we have Ava and Rascal coming from uh, uh, Olympia, Washington, and they sell 
they cultivate and sell gourmet mushrooms. Uh, they're really fun. Eric Joseph Lewis travels from the Mid-Atlantic uh, down to Florida every year and works with mushrooms and plants all the way up and down. Um, if you don't know who Trad Cotter is, then you definitely need to go read Organic Mushroom Farming and Microremediation. Um, Ryan Gates is the Ganoderma expert, like I said, and then Olga Tsogas is a, a incredible businesswoman from uh, Rochester, New York, and she runs Smugtown Mushrooms, which is one of the more uh, successful um, um, and uh, well-known and very uh, activating uh, mushroom businesses and they do a lot of events as well. So for those of you up in New York, you should keep an eye out for the New Moon Mycology Summit, which happens in New York State. Um, and in doing all this and traveling around a lot, uh, we do have the opportunity to meet a lot of really interesting people. Um, for those of you that don't know, this is Paul Stamets. Um, I was featured with him in a documentary called Fantastic Fungi that hopefully will be released this year. Um, and through making these connections, I've been able to uh, do things that a lot of people don't get the opportunity to do and I'm very thankful for. So this is a picture from a couple months ago uh, whenever I got to uh, go tour his facility, um, which was incredible. And in my hands, I'm holding a jar of reishi spores. So there's potential for almost all of these mushroom products um, that have yet to be exploited or yet to be explored, uh, which is probably a more uh, appealing word. Um, so yeah. Um, here we just have some beautiful mycelium. Um, this goes along with the low tech cultivation things I talk about. I do a lot of just like um, getting junk mail, uh, turning it into mushroom spawn, expanding that out, um, using that uh, to inoculate outdoor mushrooms. Um, yes, uh, from Bobby, uh, that was a jar of just reishi mushroom spores. He has an incredible amount of reishi mushroom spores. It's one of the reasons why I don't cultivate reishi um, in any of my, uh, in any of my grow rooms, um, uh, where I'm cultivating other mushrooms because they release a ridiculous amount of spores, but there are some people that are selling like reishi spore oil. I don't know the efficacy of that. I don't know how much it's been researched, but maybe there is some potential in that. Um, so info on the mycology summit, I'll have to do that after I'm done. Cause I don't want to uh, interrupt the, the presentation right now. Um, here we have some uh, uh, spore isolates. Um, so this is um, some work we're doing as far as actually creating commercial cultivation strains um, by working under a microscope, doing a small amount of spore combinations to create more pure genetics um, that may have higher potential for commercialization. Um, let's see, I only have a little bit of time left here, kind of go through. Um, we do a lot of soil creation. Um, as uh, a certified permaculture designer, I try and close the loop on the systems all of the time. Um, so we do work with different insects, um, kind of micro herding insects uh, to work in uh, breaking down our mushroom substrates, turning them into beneficial compost, turning them into nutrient amendments uh, that we then utilize uh, for new, uh, adding nutrients to our gardens where we grow food. Um, that we also bring to market, that we also use to feed ourselves and alleviate economic stress. Um, so it's a lot of fun. I mean, as a mushroom farmer, you're essentially uh, just a, a soil creator. I mean, you're just constantly creating soil. At this point, I've turned tons and tons of, of carbon into uh, uh, captured carbon and put in the soil. Um, let's see. Um, uh, this is just like a lot of foraging stuff. Um, we do forage a lot of mushrooms here. Um, in Pennsylvania throughout the year. Um, a lot of these are don't have as much potential for cultivation, like we wouldn't want to cultivate honey mushrooms. Um, there is some more information coming out as far as cultivating uh, Lady Porus species, so Lady Porus cincinnatus and uh, Lady Porus sulfurius, which are the chicken of the woods mushrooms. So we are seeing some people have success as far as cultivating those. Um, I'm working on figuring out how to cultivate maitake um, at a more reasonable scale, it is a little bit harder to cultivate than your like oyster, lion's mane type mushrooms. Um, but as soon as I figure that out, that'd be uh, really, really fun to bring to market throughout the year when it's not the actual season for mataki. Uh, Caprinus comatus does have potential for cultivation. It doesn't have as great of potential for marketing because it doesn't last that long. It doesn't store that well. Um, here we have some wild lion's mane, which can get incredibly large. Uh, we, it, you're hard pressed to be able to produce a lion's mane that large indoors. You can see this one grew really, really high up a hackberry tree. 
Um, another reason why I encourage people to get out and forage is to see genetic diversity, um, to see what time of year, what kind of humidity, what kind of environment these mushrooms are growing in. And then also to see these mushrooms growing on novel trees and also maybe potentially find mushrooms with novel uh, abilities. Um, so you typically wouldn't find a lion's mane growing on a hackberry tree. Um, and we've actually cultured this, this hackberry lion's mane um, and shared it with locals uh, who are gonna experiment with actually cultivating this lion's mane on hackberry, which would be really interesting. Um, here we have Harishim Americanum, uh, more Harishim Marinaceus. Um, here we have the wild button mushroom, the Zagaricus campestris. It has a lot of potential for cultivation as well, um, just with simple uh, spore slurries where you'll take this, or uh, my mycelial slurries where you'll take the whole mushroom, blend it up with a little bit of sugar, um, dilute it into a watering can, and actually water it into your uh, yard or your or your property, um, and you could just get these mushrooms just growing right out of the grass. Um, let's see what else I have is interesting. Um, as I told you guys about the novel ways of of playing with these different mushrooms, uh, this is the Flamulina volutipes, the enoki mushroom, and this is what it looks like when it grows with sun and high oxygen. So the stems are short, the color is very golden. Um, I think it'd be fun to um, give this mushroom light exposure and have this high CO2. So you'll have golden enokis that are long or um, let them grow with high oxygen and uh, low light where you'll have these short stem white enokis. So I think it's fun to play and create these novel experiences for people. Um, we have a lot of these reishi. Um, we do a lot of buried reishi logs um, where we'll inoculate the reishi into these logs and then bury them in the soil. Um, similar to um, um, what I was talking about earlier with the king oyster. And I'm not cultivating that chaga for whoever asked that in the, in the um, chat box. Um, that's just wild chaga. Um, but I have seen chaga actually grow in Pennsylvania where it typically isn't found. Um, but yeah, chaga does have a lot of potential as far as like marketing goes, but I don't know about potential for cultivation. I have heard of people inoculating live trees, but that's not something I recommend in a time where trees are so valuable. Um, I wouldn't recommend going around pretend, uh, intentionally killing these trees um, or intentionally inoculating them with a parasite. Um, we have a lot of chanterelles. Chanterelles really don't have as much potential for cultivation. Uh, let's see, we have another question. What's my favorite mushroom? Oh, geez. It's like asking what's your favorite child. Um, I really like cordyceps mushrooms. There's a lot of potential around cordyceps mushrooms. Um, I actually just found a uh, very rare species of cordyceps mushroom called Ophiocordyceps uh, ravinelli, uh, which grows on June bug larvae here in the East Coast. Um, so I hosted a uh, mushroom foray last weekend uh, where we found this very rare uh, cordyceps mushroom that I sent to Bastyr University to be tested for cordycepin content. Um, and hopefully uh, shortly I'll be able to get this mushroom D uh, the DNA sequenced uh, to see if it has any potential mycotoxins. Um, so if it has no potential mycotoxins and if it has um, cordycepin content, then that has potential for cultivation or potential for marketing, um, which again, I hope to be innovating uh, with, with the um, cordyceps. Um, so yeah, there's, there's the link to the New Moon Mycology Summit. I'll also drop the link uh, to my festival. Um, for everybody there. So those are two really great mushroom events that you should get involved with. Um, here we have black trumpets, which I think have the potential of like a truffle as far as like a gourmet goes. Um, was it a public forage or one you did by yourself? It was a public event, um, but it was a paid event. So we, I rented a private campground. Um, individuals came out, they paid. We usually do sliding scales. Um, and then we got two mushroom experts. We got Tugrel Deleuze. Um, we also got John Plischke, um, and they're experts both out of Pennsylvania, and they were there the whole weekend. They did um, talks. We had a, uh, a very intense uh, bully talk, talking about all these different bullies you can find in Pennsylvania. And then John Plischke talked about uh, mushroom preparations and like cooking with mushrooms and things like that. Um, so I do a lot of these um, events where we'll take people out into the forest. We'll go camping for a weekend and find all sorts of mushrooms. So it was really interesting to get out there. Um, I think I'm running to the end of my time here. Um, so let's see if there's anything else cool I can show you guys before. 
Oh, um, shiitakes have naturalized in the United States. So there are places, um, especially in Western North Carolina, where you can find these wild shiitake. And these wild shiitakes, when cloned and inoculated back into logs in the same environment, produce way faster um, and way better yields uh, than, than shiitakes that we would get from Asia um, because these are more adjusted to our natural environment. So these are some of these big shiitakes that I harvested off of an entire oak tree rather than uh, just these uh, bolts that we typically will be inoculating. Um, here's more of the truffles. These are the pecan truffles from Georgia. Uh, these grow in Georgia and Texas. There's a lot of potential for these. Um, let's see. Uh, more reishi stuff, more cordyceps stuff. So this is what the cordyceps look like that I cultivate. Um, yeah, uh, that's about it. I, I don't want to go push my time any further. Um, but these are pictures from my festival, Mycosymbiotics Mushroom and Arts Festival. Uh, we'll be outside Harrisburg this year at Camp Riley. Um, if anybody wants to participate, it's going to be an amazing event. I definitely recommend it. Check out mycofest.net. Um, and I really appreciate being able to present to you guys today. Um, if anybody would care to, uh, you can go follow me at uh, Mycosymbio on Instagram. Um, my YouTube uh, is Apex Grower, um, Mycoshop.net for if you want to purchase anything. Um, and yeah, definitely just reach out, you know. Um, I'm pretty open to communication. I do consultations. Um, I'd really love to be more involved um, with any of the work that's going on in New York. I might be doing a lion's mane cultivation uh, class this month in Brooklyn. So stay tuned or check out my Instagram. I'll post dates if that end up, ends up working out. Um, I'm not selling the wild shiitake strain right now uh, because I wasn't able to get another sample of it this year and I lost a lot of my cultures when I moved. Um, but hopefully by next year, um, because they fruit really well in the spring, maybe if they get another fall fruiting, um, I can get a sample of that because, uh, the one, the one, uh, example that I showed you guys was actually on my friend's property. So he can keep an eye out for those. Um, and if they grow again, he'll send me a dry specimen so I can clone it and then offer that wild shiitake strain. But, um, they also have been spotted in Boston. Um, so I think that they might be up in the New York area. Um, and it's just good to just keep your eye open. Um, we do have lots of wild gold oysters here in Pennsylvania with all the mushroom farms that are over here in Pennsylvania. Um, so Nia asked, do I have a website for my business? Um, currently, I just have my uh, shop site. I'm working on updating my business site. Um, as an independent business owner, I haven't worked for anybody since 2015, um, but that also puts a lot of stress on me. Um, as just being somebody that dropped out of high school, I don't really have that great of an education as far as math goes and um, business management and things like that. So I have, to, I've ha I have had to depend on other people um, and, and work with other people to make sure that my business stays successful. Um, and uh, um, just trying to figure out all the financial ends.